Uh, here we go. I'm streaming to live on Facebook. And let's go to. So today we're going to be uh, getting a presentation from Nahal Gogai from the Bay Conservation and Development Commission. So Nahal Gogai has more than a decade of experience advancing environmental justice and ecosystem protection efforts throughout the United States. Nahal, Nahal joined San Francisco BCDC in December 2019 as its first ever environmental justice manager. She's also the founder and director of Equal Equity Consulting, which helps clients develop strategies for the equitable inclusion of low income, people of color, tribal, immigrant, refugees, and other marginalized or underrepresented communities in climate and environmental planning, policy, and public funding processes. In addition to her environmental and social justice advocacy, Nahal's work has included climate resilience planning, collaborative resource management, environmental education and outreach, and emergency preparedness. Nahal earned her master's degree in environmental studies at Evergreen State College and her bachelor's of arts in literature and the environment from the University of Texas at Austin. Welcome, Nahal. Thank you so much, Phoenix. And thanks everyone. So happy to be here with you all. Um, I uh, have been working with Phoenix and with, uh, you know, Miss Margaret and the whole West Oakland um, Environmental Indicators Project team for probably, I think it's been six to seven, maybe six years now. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, so Phoenix is one of my good friends and, um, and I look forward to making some new friends today. So thanks again for being here. I'm excited to share about some of the work that we do at BCDC and maybe um, if you maybe share some new information about, you know, sea level rise and the types of tools that we have available to help us plan um, for the upcoming um, issues from climate change. So I'm going to start sharing my screen and please bear with me as I get the correct view up. Okay, great. So yeah, again, um, I'm the Environmental Justice Manager at the Bay Conservation and Development Commission. And yeah, I'll be, I just wanna give you a quick overview of what we'll be talking about today. Um, so just some background on who BCDC is, what our jurisdiction is. Um, I'll do a little uh, run through of something we have called the Flood Explorer. Um, it's a tool that helps you understand um, potential flood impacts in your community and other areas in the bay that you hold near and dear. Um, also, I'll go through some of our uh, the process that went into our new environmental justice and social equity policies at the agency. Um, I'll share more about some tools that we're developing to help us implement those policies and uh, share some more about some of the community partners that we have been working with to ensure that all of our work is community led and community informed um, as much as possible at this point. Um, and beyond that, um, I'll talk a little bit about some um, operations as much as possible at this whole, point. I'm sorry, um, you're, you're, you're having a weird beyond echo. Beyond that, um, I'll talk a little bit about some um, operations as much as possible at this whole, point. I'm sorry. Um, you're, you're having a weird echo. Beyond that, um, oh, you know I'll what's talk going a little on. bit about There's an echo. Hold on. I'm sorry. Um, you're, you're, you're having a weird echo. Okay, I see what's going on. Sorry, it was the, the live stream was coming through. Sorry about that. <laughs> Keep going. Now I'm going to update my, um, go back to my headset because it, it, I turned off my headset. I'm wondering if that was the issue. So one second. Um, you want to try now? Well, let me see if it reconnects. I'm hoping it connects. One second. Sorry. I thought that was on my end. Um, Okay, I don't think it's. Oh, let me see here. Um, 
I don't know if you can see all this, but I'm trying to figure out my head back. I think I have to stop sharing one second, everyone. I was trying to troubleshoot and that wasn't necessary. Okay, got it. Everyone can hear me okay? Okay, awesome. Cool, so I'm going to reshare. Okay, share. And are you seeing my notes or just the presentation? Hello? Hello? Yeah. Well, um, you sound muffled. I can't really make out what... Uh... Oh, really? Oh. Yeah. It was better last time other than yeah. the echo, mm -hmm. but now it's muffled and I can't get it clear. I hope it's not my hearing, but it, it sounds Is it for too. everyone? Oh, now it Did sounds it? better. Oh, good. Now, good. It's, now it's clear. Awesome. Yeah, okay. I can see your notes. Okay. Let me unstop share and then go back. <laughs> I got to start over here. Uh, that's okay. Go to... And you're good now. Okay, you still can't see them? Yeah, I yep. can't see them. No, now. That's Yay. good. Yay. Awesome. Okay. So, um, great. Thank you for letting me know that uh, my voice was muffled. I appreciate that. Um, so, I'll also go over some possible uh, projects, some ideas that I asked our staff to share about possible projects that could um, be of interest to you for you know, community leadership. Um, and then beyond that, I'll share about a, a project that uh, Phoenix is actually pretty heavily involved in called Bay Adapt. Um, and that's a regional shoreline strategy um, for a rising bay. And um, that's about it. And then we'll have time for questions. And just even though there's a section at the end for questions, I do welcome you if anything is unclear to speak up, interrupt me, I don't care. Um, you can also raise your hand and I'll try to uh, take note and, and call out um, if, you know, let you know that I see you and uh, offer you to ask your question. So yeah, with that, I will just go straight into sharing more about who VCDC is. So the San Francisco Bay Conservation and Development Commission is um, what BCDC stands for. And we're a state uh, agency that works to exclusively um, protect and work in the San Francisco Bay. Our mission is to protect and enhance the San Francisco Bay and encourage the Bay's responsible and produ productive use of resources for this and future generations. In many ways, the commission has been remarkably successful in achieving its mission. Before we were established, um, BCDC, or before we were established, which was in 1965, um, an average of about 2,300 acres of the bay were being filled each year for development. And now only a few acres a year are filled annually. And most of the projects that are placing the fill are, um, have to be mitigate, they have to mitigate their project impacts typically by restoring additional bay land. And as a result, the bay is now larger than it was even when BCDC was established. And likewise, when the commission established was established only four miles of the bay shoreline was open to the public. And now over 350 miles of the bay shoreline <clears throat> includes public access and is part of the San Francisco Bay Trail. Much of this process was through BCDC requirements, um, through our permitting program. So we do, we protect and we approve hundreds of projects that aim to enliven, enhance and protect the shoreline, including ports, marinas, uh, uh, development, parks, wetlands, bridges, and flood protection. So we know that the Bay is a constantly changing system and through natural, and this is done through natural and man-made processes. Um, and the shoreline has just 
it's been constantly changing over time. Even right now today, we're connected to the waters of the bay. Um, all of us, it sounds like if you're in West Oakland, you're probably just within a mile or so of the shoreline. And I'm, I I'm assume that you might have interacted with the um, bay by now since this is your fourth uh, session. So if you hadn't before, I think I've seen pictures of you all actually sitting um, on the shoreline, which is wonderful. Um, but so the, they, the communities that, um, that reside, as you are well aware, as a community member that resides near the bay, we have to continuously adapt to the changing conditions. <clears throat> One moment, I'm going to get a sip of water. So, <clears throat> so while flooding is not new, um, each year we see flooding in the bay with winter storms, uh, swollen rivers, and exceptionally high tides that flood the streets and cities around the bay that often will leave community members stranded. Um, so I'm not sure if anyone here, if you have been impacted by flooding, but I wanna just get a, a gauge. Um, feel free to just say, I have, like go off mute and say, I have been, I have, or raise your hand, or I'm just curious if anyone here has felt like you've been impacted by the issue of flooding. Okay, so it looks like I see one hand raised. Um, I'll raise my hand, but that was when I lived in, in Texas. So there was flash flooding was a regular occurrence in Texas. Um, so, so we know that flooding is a part of the Bay's history, but today the water in San Francisco Bay is rising and the flooding that we've seen in the past is only expected to get worse. So, um, we just need to all be aware that uh, even though it hasn't felt like an issue quite yet, it's um, more than likely going to become one for, if not for us, then for our, um, you know, our descendants. Um, so where is all the flooding coming from? It's actually coming from a variety of sources. Um, as I said, major storms are a big one, and then there's high tides, and now there is sea level rise. So these forms of flooding can occur individually and lead to flooding, or when they happen together, they add to the severity of the flooding issues. So what exactly is causing sea levels to rise? Um, as you're probably aware, um, as more carbon dioxide goes into the atmosphere from things like cars, gasoline, losing wetlands and other um, mitigation ecosystems, mitigating ecosystems, um, it's causing the planet to warm, and the warming is leading to a variety of changes of the Earth's climate with many detrimental consequences for the people and nature. Um, one of these impacts is sea level rise. So as the planet warms, the ocean warms too. And when water warms, it actually expands, which is one of the main reasons for sea level rise. And the second reason is because of what we always hear, which is the melting glaciers and ice caps. Um, that's actually adding more water to the oceans, and that's leading to the ocean, the ocean water to rise. So um, as we learn about this, we probably are coming from the perspective of uh, what's going to happen and try to understand a little bit better of what we can do um, to adapt. Um, so while it will happen more often and stays uh, longer, um, it's, it's also going to uh, be less likely to retreat. So if you have been in, you know, exposed to flooding problems in the past, um, after a few days, it will usually retreat. Um, but with the way that our models show is that um, the flooding would more than likely be what they call is inundation. Um, that means that the flood waters won't retreat. And that's partly to do with shoreline erosion and overtopping. So the, the natural um, infrastructure that's there to ensure that there's kind of a barrier between our communities um, and the bay are gradually eroding. And also um, we've learned that through some of the new models that we've been um, partnering on that groundwater is actually rising um, beneath us. And it's uh, having things like saltwater intrusion into um, our groundwater and so there's 
there's plenty of issues that come along with um, sea level rise. So what what can we do about all this? Um, so even so, our maps show us what it would look like if we don't take action. So I'll go over and I'll show you some of the um, maps soon of what it looks like if we don't take action. Um, so um, the actions that you are taking right now by being a part of the Shoreline Leadership Academy um, is actions that you're doing with your community and with your government to help protect the places that you care for. And, um, and we know that these things can be done. They've been done before in other parts of the world. And so BCDC is here to help you understand where the flooding happens, what kinds of impacts can occur, and then we can support you with both with working directly with your local government to get the right kind of protection, um, as well as providing the tools and the data and information required um, to fully understand the dynamics of these floods. So um, a little bit of background of our work um, is in 2010, BCDC and, the, and NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Association, brought together a local, regional, state, and uh, federal agency group. Um, it included uh, nonprofits as well um, for some collaborative planning projects um, along the Bay. And actually, we started in Alameda County. And this program is uh, what's called the Adapting to Rising Tides Sub-Regional Project. And that was to identify how current and flooding and future flooding will affect communities, infrastructure, ecosystems, and the economy on the Alameda County shoreline. So since then, the ART program has continued to lead and support uh, multi-sector cross-jurisdictional projects that build local and regional capacity in across the Bay to plan and impl implement adaptation responses. These efforts have enabled the ART program to test and refine our adaptation planning methods to integrate sustainability and transparent decision-making from start to finish and foster robust collaboration that leads to action on adaptation. So the ART program elements are listed here. Um, it's, we're now working across the region in all nine counties, um, and we are integrating adaptation into the local and regional planning and decision-making um, processes in multiple ways. Um, firstly, we're leading collaborative adaptation projects um, to help build a comprehensive understanding of climate vulnerability risk develop, and to develop equitable and effective adaptation responses. Um, so this, this graphic here is showing a, uh, one of the, pro it was made by one of our program staff and it was used for an engagement exercise with a stakeholder group to explore functional and physical linkages among community assets and services, built infrastructure and natural shorelines that contribute to climate vulnerability. Um, beyond the, uh, our, you know, leading the collaborative adaptation planning, we also assist adaptation planning efforts across the Bay with local governments and with local communities. Um, we provide, we have the, the art portfolio, um, all of our research combines um, a comprehensive set of resources. It includes how-to guides and tools. Um, we also have a help desk to support local planning um, if they have specific questions that they have for our staff. Um, and we, this is all publicly available on our website. Uh, we also build regional capacity for adaptation by working with your communities and with uh, local government, as well as state and federal agencies to continue finding funding to develop capacity at the local scale and support all scales for this work. Um, and we also advocate for adaptation through communicating our findings um, and needs to the state and federal uh, levels to ensure that grants and other assistant program, assistance programs are informed by and responsive to the specific uh, site-specific conditions that we are um, experiencing in the Bay. Sorry if you're hearing my baby screaming in the background. Um, so the Adapting to Rising Tides program developed a website to help Bay Area communities prepare for the impacts of current and future flooding from sea level rise and storm surges 
Um, and so you can go in and explore maps of flood risk along the shoreline and download the data for further analysis. And these maps are aimed to increase understanding of what could be at risk without future planning and help communities and government drive action. So it's called the Bay Shoreline Flood Explorer, and it was launched to help communities understand flood risks um, from sea level rise. And the real main goal is to empower everyone to understand risk from sea level rise and, and to feel empowered to be engaged in finding solutions. So it's really just building knowledge and understanding so that when we all come to the um, table and we all come together to plan, um, we can uh, use this, this information as kind of like a baseline um, shared understanding of, of our goals. So this is the link below um, to the actual Flood Explorer. And I'm just gonna quickly go through the tutorial that they include on that um, when you go to the link. So it just explains again that flooding comes from multiple um, um, dynamics and, and uh, processes that happen just like tides, uh, um, sea level rise and storm surges. And again, these can happen individually and um, they do happen cumulatively as well. So they will, they kind of, um, uh, exacerbate the impacts as they happen as um, alongside each other. So the bay experiences um, two high tides and two low tides every day. And the height of the highest uh, daily tides are averaged over time. And that's called the mean high, higher high water or MHHW. So we refer to the MHHW as high tide in all of these graphics. Um, king tides are exceptionally high tides that typically occur several times during the year um, during a new or full moon and when the earth is closest to the moon. Unlike king tides, which are temporary, sea level rise results in permanent increased water levels. And the latest science tells us that the bay should be prepared for um, six to 10 inches of sea level rise by 2030 and 13 to 23 inches of sea level rise by 2050. So um, that's pretty soon. And it's challenging to predict the amount of sea level rise we may experience closer to the year 2100, in part because we don't know how much, how quickly the world will cut greenhouse gas emissions. So finally, a storm surge is the buildup of water during a storm generated by high winds and low atmospheric pressure. Um, so storm surges are also a temporary increase in water levels. And, um, and so you've probably heard of the different uh, types of storm surges, um, and they're based on the probability that they will occur in any given year. So for example, a five-year storm surge has a one in five chance of occurring on any given year. So it's about 20% chance of a five-year storm surge to happen this year. And then a 50 year storm surge has a one in 50 chance or 2% chance of occurring any given year. So just as you have, um, so yeah. I'm gonna skip that. And then we have um, something called the one map many futures approach, which allows you to look at a map of a single total water level and see flooding resulting from all of the different scenarios. For example, the total water level of a 36 inch, um, 36 inches above high tide can result from the example here, which is a 50 year storm surge today, six inches of sea level rise, plus a 25 year storm surge. Um, and so there's, there's various scenarios that we offer for you to go through if you're interested in the dynamics of sea level rise. So later on in the presentation, um, I want to share the link to this and offer you all the opportunity to kind of um, explore the Flood Explorer tool. Um, so moving on to uh, something that I think you'll be learning more about later this afternoon from um, someone from SFPI, um, but I wanted to just go over it quickly because it is in your part of the Bay um, and it's something, it's an assessment that um, the BCDC Adapting to Rising Tides program produced 
and it's called the Local Assessment of the San Leandro Bay. And this assessment is to help jurisdictions um, and stakeholders in the general public really understand all of the vulnerabilities to flooding and sea level rise um, that were assessed for this uh, report. And it includes critical systems that will be impacted, such as your transportation systems, vulnerable communities, priority development areas, and priority conservation areas. So um, part of the San Leandro Bay local assessment is described in detail according to its operational landscape unit. Um, so these are the boundaries, the black line around this um, shows the boundaries that's used to organize and help identify the significant assets that should be considered in part of one unit, um, because these this is where we were able to identify the um, the assets in the in this boundary are part of an interdependent system. So the San Leandro Operational Landscape Unit spans from I, south of I-80 um, to Oyster Bay down in San Leandro. And um, as you're well aware, I'm sure the area is highly developed with a wide variety of uses, including download, downtown Oakland, commercial and business use, housing, recreation, entertainment, sporting, the port, natural shorelines, and the Oakland International Airport. Um, so I won't get into all the technical details here because again, um, SFEI uh, will be focusing on this later this afternoon, but I, I can provide the link to the full report um, that uh, BCDC put together if you're interested. Um, so as far as the case study on the San Leandro Bay um, that we have available through the Flood Explorer, um, I'm just sharing the one foot flooding case study. Um, so this example shows our map and it only shows flooding in this area. Um, it's the main area is kind of uh, Coliseum, Jingletown, Chinatown, Jack London, West Oakland and the Oakland Airport. and um, other than the flooding that you see down here in the blue, the bottom right of the screen, uh, that's around Doolittle Drive and the MLK regional shoreline. Other than that, at one foot of sea level rise, um, which is in about 10 years, it, we're not seeing a ton of impacts from sea level rise alone. Um, however, by three feet of sea level rise, we suddenly see that all of these things that we care about become flooded. Um, or we have limited access to these. So this will um, impact schools, uh, it'll impact community services, public utilities, transportation, um, and recreational access. Um, so when will we see this three foot level of flooding? As I mentioned, it's a complicated uh, question, but the short answer is that this flooding could actually happen today with a very large storm surge. Um, and it would have to be larger than a storm surge that the Bay Area has seen in 50 years, but the likelihood is still there. Um, or it could happen many years down the line. Um, so we are predicting that it, you know, reliably would happen um, around 2050, which is still within our, our many of our lifetimes. Um, and so as you can see, the Oakland International Airport down here is completely blue. Um, and so with this assessment, it indicates that the East Oakland and the Coliseum regional hotspot um, has a cluster of assets that are uh, also included in the, um, in the highest consequence of total flooding. Um, we have some hotspots that we've indicated throughout the Bay and the San Leandro Bay in this specific area um, around the airport is considered one of the major hotspots because that, as you, we are all aware is a, major um, asset and piece of infrastructure in your general community. So with all that, I'm gonna move on. Um, before I move on to the next section, cause I'm, I'm gonna share more about the work that we're doing at BCDC on um, incorporating environmental justice and social equity into our efforts. I did wanna quickly just take a little pause um, and see if anyone has questions or, uh, oops, or uh, or if you just, yeah, wanted to check on anything, pardon as I get back. It looks like, um, Devani, you have a question? Hi, I have a question. Oh, um, 
let's see here. Sorry. Tim, Tim, was that you, Tamila? Tamila, you can go ahead. I think, Devani, thank you. I'm going to, I'll go to you right after, I think. There's a little bit of a overlap. That's okay. Go ahead, Tamila. Hey, sorry, I just had a quick question. Um, I'm curious about whether or not there's been discussion about levies for the bay. If that's like something that's ever been considered and what's like, is that even feasible for our like? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so there have been discussions about levies um, that I'm aware of. I'm not, I'm not actually, I mean, I'm an environmental justice manager, so I'm learning um, just by hearing updates from my colleagues um, who are more kind of the permit staff that are working on, um, that talk about things like levies and uh, natural infrastructure. Uh, <clears throat> so we are, I, I am aware of an effort in the Richmond area to develop a uh, what's called a horizontal levy, which is, um, I believe it's going to be what's considered green infrastructure. So the Richmond community has come together um, because there is a wastewater treatment plant um, right on the water there. And so they're, they really feel like it's a high priority for them to protect it. So they are discussing a levy in that area. And I think that um, the goal is for it to be a green levy or a horizontal um, living levy, um, but it's but I don't I'm not informed enough on that to know uh, you know if they've decided yet what the levy will look like. Um, but they're definitely preparing with that design right now. Um, beyond that, I have not heard of other levy design projects, um, but it's a good question and I wonder if the person presenting from SFEI later this afternoon might have a better idea so I recommend double checking with um, with her later this afternoon because that's a really good question um, hopefully that was helpful um, thank you so Devani thanks for your patience hi my name is Devani Devani uh, sorry I was wondering if you could give us like a quick breakdown about how sea level rise probability is assessed and like how often that site is updated, like who collects the data, um, just like a breakdown of how that site even works on the back end. Yeah. Um, again, that's a question that I, my colleague who's the GIS uh, manager would be a better person to answer. Um, but I do believe that when the, um, when NOAA, NOAA's actually kind of more um, taking lead on the research about like the modeling itself. Um, they, have, they have a program called Coastal Zone Management and, it's, and all that program is, is um, working with all of the coastal management agencies across the, the entire United States and making sure that um, when the latest science is um, available, that all of the those agencies are updating our um, data and our modeling tools. So um, we we try our best. We're kind of a small team. Our especially our mapping team is is only like one and a half staff, um, so not much. Um, but from what I remember, we are relatively um, our team is relatively uh, quick on the turnaround when it comes to new data. So. Um, I, I don't have like the actual background in modeling and uh, you know the GIS and uh, sea level rise modeling to know exactly um, all of the details, but I have seen the charts of the correlation between you know like carbon dioxide emissions and um, greenhouse gas emissions and how uh, that you know the charts of you know all of the different scenarios of if we emit X amount of greenhouse gas emissions. Um, then the sea level will rise this amount. Um, so I can find the, I could ask about the resources that, um, that we use to guide our modeling efforts and the actual backend numbers and, and follow up with you and share that with you because that's also a very good question. Thank you. I hope that was helpful. <laughs> cool, any other questions before I move on? Great. 
Okay, thank you. Um, so as you might recall in the first slide where I went over the introduction to BCDC, there was a blue image called the San Francisco Bay Plan. It was a, the cover of our Bay Plan. Um, and so that um, is our policy guide. It's like our guiding document on all of the policies that we follow and implement um, through our work uh, on the shoreline. And so that document um, goes through a regular amendment process. And uh, one of the relatively recent um, processes led to, uh, it was a, called the San Francisco Bay Plan Amendment um, for Environmental Justice and Social Equity. And, um, and it was actually the result of a previous amendment that was about climate change specifically. So in 2011, BCDC acknowledged um, through updating our climate change policies that uh, shoreline flooding will affect communities differently depending on location, resources, and adaptive capacity. So in particular, we realized that low-income communities and those underrepresented or marginalized groups um, may have more difficulty preparing for, responding to, and recovering from floods. So many of the communities that are that are also disproportionately exposed to hazardous or to toxic substances um, will more than likely be exacerbated from uh, things like if contaminants are mobilized by flood waters. And these were all things that were um, more deeply, uh, I guess, assessed and realized through our climate change um, policies. So this led to the development of our environmental justice and social equity policies um, being identified as a high priority for both the policies, um, for both the Adapting to Rising Tides report, um, as well as um, the commission's overall uh, policy guide, the San Francisco Bay Plan. So um, in some cases, we BCDC acknowledges that in some cases, the permits, um, the permitted developments that we have provided permits for may have placed additional burdens upon certain communities and um, has led to potentially increased pollution or even displacement of residents. So in order for BCDC to ensure that our mission is applied equi equitably and fairly, um, we realized it was important for us to examine how our policies and practices may be contributing to or exacerbating environmental injustice and social inequity and identify opportunities for change. So the goal of the environmental justice and social equity amendment was to amend the Bay Plan to incorporate principles of EJ and social equity into planning, design, and permitting of shoreline projects in and along the San Francisco Bay. The scope of changes to address social equity and environmental justice cut across multiple policy sections in our Bay Plan. So, um, so it really, the, the, the goals are to address things like uh, equitable and equal public access, um, assessing disproportionate burdens, and more, more specifically, um, sea level rise vulnerability. So um, this map that you see on the slide is an example. It's, it's one of our other tools that, um, that I've asked Phoenix to share the link with you all. Um, it's called the Community Vulnerability Mapping Tool. And it indicates social vulnerability based on the indicators that you see here, these 12 listed here. Um, I hope you can read that, but uh, if not, the link has a full really um, easy to follow tutorial on how we developed um, the actual maps. So we have highest social vulnerability, high social vulnerability, moderate vulnerability, and then the blue is what you're seeing for that 66 inches of sea level rise. Um, and it, show, it, it helps us assess uh, the sea level rise impact specifically to highly vulnerable communities. So um, back to the policies and the development process of the policies, um, just as we were, we were working, BCDC was working on the um, environmental justice and social equity Bay Plan Amendment, um, they worked closely with a team that I, I actually was convening. At the time I was a consultant 
Um, and I was convening this team that we called the Environmental Justice Review Team. And um, the team, all of us received uh, fa private foundation funding to make sure that we are uh, contributing to the process that was mostly being led by a BCDC staff, but just making sure that community voices were involved in the actual new policies. So the Environmental Justice Review Team's goal was to develop robust community recommendations regarding environmental justice, social equity principles and practices for consideration in BCDC staff planning re report regarding the uh, environmental justice and social equity Bay Plan Amendment. So the EJ review team you see here consisted of leaders from Bayview Hunters Point and Treasure Island, um, Marin City, uh, a group that serves um, communities throughout the Alameda County. And then we have, uh, as you see, Terry Green here in the middle from East, I mean, sorry, <laughs> um, she's from Marin City. And then we have uh, a few members from East Palo Alto here. And then the other folks in the photo are staff who were involved. And then there's also um, some actual commissioners who are part of something called the Environmental Justice Working Group. And it's kind of a volunteer working group that the commissioners that chose to prioritize environmental justice and social equity um, are volunteering and they still to this day are meeting on a quarterly basis to provide any um, input and guidance to the process as we um, implement the new policies. So back in October of 2019, BCDC, unanim BCDC commissioners unanimously voted to amend our guiding principles and our policies um, in the Bay Plan to reflect our acknowledgement that shoreline flooding will affect communities disproportionately depending on resources and uh, location and adaptive capacity. And actually, um, once the in December of 2019, the policies were actually um, incorporated into our uh, permitting process. And that same month, I was hired to be the CDC's first environmental justice manager. And since then, I've been working directly with these staff and all of staff and these commissioners and all of the commissioners, um, as well as trying to continue the uh, community voice um, from the environmental justice review team leaders on developing an inclusive and meaningful implementation strategy for the new policies. Um, and so again, these are the uh, these are the sections of the Bay Plan that have been amended. So we have a new section that talks about our environmental justice and social equity guiding principles, which I'll share soon. And we have a new section that's only about environmental justice and social equity. Um, our public access section has uh, major components now that have been updated to address the um, goals of environmental justice and social equity, as well as the sections on shoreline protection and mitigation. And so some of the, just generally speaking, um, our policy requirements are for permit applicants to consider environmental justice and social equity as early as possible in their planning process. Um, and that includes things like meaningful community involvement and assessing fair treat or assessing um, disproportionate impact and ensuring fair treatment. So this is I know there's a lot of text, but I did want to point out that um, again, as we we updated our policies, we also um, had a whole separate process where the commissioners uh, decided on some guiding principles for the agency as a whole, because our policies are specifically for our permits and the types of projects that we grant permits to. But we wanted to have a list of guiding principles for the agency to embody as a whole. So um, those are focused on recognizing and acknowledging California Native American communities, maintaining and ensuring our commitment to um, the Bay being a public resource, um, striving to build trust and partnerships with underrepresented communities and community-based organizations, and endeavoring to eliminate disproportionate adverse impacts caused by BCDC's actions and activities, um, ensuring that the needs of vulnerable shoreline communities are addressed in climate adaptation, and working closely with 
all stakeholders to address issues of, of environmental justice and social equity and continual, continually building accountability, transparency, and accessibility into all of our programs and processes. So as you can see, that's kind of a lot. That's that. This basically in, um, is about 50% of my job is to make sure that the agency is figuring out ways to follow these new principles that they've set forth for themselves. Um, and so this is a flow chart design showing um, the regulatory process that we follow or that, that is needed for permits. Um, so someone applying for a BCDC permit might also need to go through some of these other examples. Um, but as you can see in this process, um, we're pretty late in the overall timeline. So not all of these types of permits are applicable for every single project, um, but these are just in a list again of examples of, um, of types of processes that the permit applicant will need to go through, sometimes several years before they even reach BCDC. So um, there's CEQA, there's the local government approval, there's the Department of Toxic, Toxics and Substance Control approval, the Water Board, Water Quality Certification, and then there's also federal, state, um, Department of Fish and Wildlife, biological opinion. Um, and then we come in and then maybe after us, if needed, is the Army Corps of Engineers. Um, and so, sorry again if you can hear the background screaming, it's lunchtime for the baby. So, um, uh, so, as, so when they come to BCDC for a permit, that's really when we have um, the authority to require our new environmental justice uh, policy requirements. But as you heard in my last slide, um, we, do, we do everything we can to encourage the agencies before us or to encourage the process before us to um, address environmental justice and social equity considerations. Because as we all know, um, you can't, at, you know, when they're coming to BCDC for a permit and we say, have you done meaningful community engagement in the adjacent uh, highly socially vulnerable communities? And they say, what exactly does that mean? I, I filled the CEQA process. I met the local government's approval. Um, and then we tell them um, that that wasn't adequate. It's not very efficient, A, for them as the permit applicant to have to go back and do a whole other round of public outreach and engagement. Um, but it's, not, it's also not the way that we want people to view environmental justice requirements. We always want everyone to understand that it needs to happen as early as possible in the whole planning process. So that's part of BCDC's job is to really um, convene and develop relationships with all of the other um, permitting agencies and the local government to let them know that we have these new requirements so that um, everyone is part of the conversation as soon as, as possible. Um, so the types of projects that we require are, um, are we call them major projects and appropriate minor projects. Um, the projects that are represented, um, that are in underrepresented or close to underrepresented communities or disadvantaged communities. Um, and so the Bay Plan policy, um, I'm going to take a quick break. I need to check on something really quick. I'm very sorry. One second. Okay, sorry, y'all. Um, he's teething, so he's like in total loud, screamy mode. Um, <laughs> so, uh, you know what? That's good. He knows what he wants, and that's yeah, good, yeah, very vocal about what he wants, and that's a good thing. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm like he's like me. He's an advocate. Um, <laughs> so yeah, yeah, I got my voice for sure. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so yeah, so when we say that we require meaningful community involvement in our in our um, permit applications, uh, this is you know this is kind of just some 
examples, the way that we define it in the policies. Um, but it's mainly to make sure that people have the opportunity, at least the opportunity to participate in the decisions and activities that are going to um, affect their environment and health. Um, and it, we wanna make sure that the public's contribution actually influences the, our, our agency's decision, final decision, as well as other regulatory agencies' decisions. Um, we, we are developing ways to ensure that the community concerns that were expressed are genuinely considered in the decision-making process. Um, and so we're working on finding ways to facilitating the involvement of potentially impacted communities um, and I'll get into more details of, of what, how we're trying, how we're carrying this out. Um, but again, you know, I'm beyond just explaining the policies and the requirements. I want to just let you know that as an agency, we recognize that community involvement um, is necessary to uh, establish and rebuild community trust because we know that there's a, a lack of trust between um, many of uh, the underrepresented communities that we want to engage and a government agency such as ourselves. So um, we also see that these designs that are coming from community leaders such as yourselves are actually more innovative. Um, the approaches are much more innovative and they're actually more relevant to the emerging concerns within your community. Obviously, these reflect your community's voices. Overall, it strengthens democracy. It helps uh, develop sustainable projects because if there's community buy-in and involvement, the projects are um, going to remain respected and going to remain um, a source of pride potentially in the community, which ensures its overall sustainability. Um, it also establishes legitimate public policy saying that the public legitimately um, informed our policies. And also, as you're doing here with the West Oakland Shoreline Leadership Academy, um, this community involvement, um, it'll, it continues building the capacity that, you're, that you are starting to um, refine in this program. So some of the key elements, I just wanted to go over and show that these are when I try to, um, when I do trainings with our staff, and with our permit applicants, I try to kind of drive home that um, meaningful community involvement includes things like plain language, um, transparency, and information sharing, um, ongoing dialogue, not just like checking in and saying we check the box, we talk to communities. Attitude and behavior is more getting at the, the need for humility um, and respect when engaging communities. Um, genuine active listening. And again, back to the dialogue, it's more about relationship building than just having um, one-off conversations and thinking that you've done enough to engage the local community. So I wanna just go back to the community vulnerability mapping tool and just quickly share that this tool is, um, while it's showing us um, at BCDC how uh, sea level rise will impact communities. We're actually using it now to, now that we have our EJ policies, we're using the tool to um, support our permit applicants as they will be required to conduct outreach in these communities. And so um, when they know that their, their project is going to be in a, in a specific site, we tell them that they need to use this, this tool, this mapping tool, and um, assess whether or not their new project will be, um, or their permit will be in within or adjacent to one of these highly vulnerable communities. And if so, that will initiate our requirements to conduct community involvement and um, the other requirements that I shared. So something new that we're developing in addition to the tool, it's kind of like based off of the tool I just shared, um, is the community-based organization directory mapping tool. So beyond just sharing that map with permit applicants and saying, look, you're close to a um, community that's highly so, you know, socially vulnerable, you need to do this level of outreach. Now we're developing a directory to um, make sure that the, the community members that the permit applicant is speaking with about their permits and about their project designs 
um, are genuine environmental justice community-based representatives. Because as you probably are all aware, there are frequently examples that I hear of where the developer can pay a community member to say what they want them to say at the public hearings when the developer is asking for a permit. Um, and um, that's obviously corrupt. So uh, this tool is really focused on ensuring that the right, like the vetted, genuine, legitimate environmental justice community um, representatives are informed of these proposed projects and are providing uh, leadership and guidance on um, how to engage the community and what the community's concerns are. So, um, so again, the content um, is to, we want to explain through this tool the new requirements. And then also in addition to just providing contact information for environmental justice leaders, we really want this tool to um, include some uh, guidance on how to conduct meaningful community engagement in a way that's, um, that's respectful to the community members um, and to explain the, the necessity to incorporate community engagement activities into their budget. Um, beyond just your typical kind of like one-off meeting stipends that they might even provide. Those are beyond, uh, sadly, those are still considered um, an extra bonus on a lot of these projects, but the goal is really to go beyond that and to have the community members be a active partner on the permit design, on the planning design um, and on the permit application. So the budget we hope will reflect that, showing that you all are considered um, beyond just a community person that's coming to a meeting, but more so as an expert and a consultant that can charge at an hourly rate for your input. And those are just some examples of what this tool can do. Um, I would love, I don't know if we've shared this with you yet. I, I might um, follow up, but this is, um, it's the two pager, it's kind of like our, our flyer that we're sending out to invite um, community-based organizations and other community leaders to provide your um, story or to, to share your story or to share your information if you're interested in being more involved in um, shoreline planning projects. So right now, we're hoping that we have this survey out. We, we sent it out just a few weeks back. We have about 30 groups so far represented on in the directory that have direct, have um, offered their information to be placed in the directory. Um, but we're in constant conversations with um, with you know our environmental justice partners and community partners about um, how to be reliable and accountable stewards of this directory because I realized that as a community that's been um, underrepresented and marginalized historically, you probably don't feel so great about sharing your story or your data or your contact info in a tool that's being managed by the government. And so I understand that. And so we're trying to kind of refine our strategy of how this directory will become public um, when that happens. Um, so again, uh, I want to just get back to some of the projects and the ways that you all um, are currently working on building resilience in your community um, and ideas for projects that maybe you might want to uh, participate in as you are um, building your skill set for uh, community sea level rise protection through the Shoreline Leadership Academy. So. Um, so, you know, resilience is much broader than uh, just sea level rise protection. Um, your community already knows what resilience is and how to bounce back and recover when, when faced with challenges. Um, and so I'm, I'm really excited to be a part, to be here today with you all, because you all are leading the way on self-organizing and becoming stronger advocates for your community. Um, and so I think that you're, it's really exciting that your perspectives can now be um, incorporated and you can contribute to the creative designs of things like the levees that um, were mentioned earlier and the other sorts of infrastructure that can be placed between 
um, your city, your community, and the bay that will protect you, um, protect you from flood flooding. So um, one example is a marsh. So there is um, at least one marsh that I'm aware of on the Oakland um, shoreline. And it's over, uh, it was created in the 1870s actually, um, when there was a dam in the San Leandro Creek. And so, um, so the San Leandro, um, it's one of the last uh, remaining historic marshes in the East Bay. Um, and it's, and you know, as you know, it is surrounded by an urban area, but, at, but it is a very valuable habitat for, um, various types of bird species and Pacific flyover species. Um, so it's a really interesting story of the intersection of development and the connectivity to the bay and how nature can rebound. Um, and so marshes need time and space to, to recover and to um, expand and they could really use some stewards such as yourself to, um, to act on um, maintaining this type of marsh or maybe coming up with um, ideas for other types of marsh projects that um, the CDC, the reason I'm using this example is because this is something that we permitted already, but I want this to use a, be an example for ideas as you develop your projects um, once you are, graduate or are ready to start developing your own um, projects. So again, um, learning about environmental and social issues on the shoreline um, is going to help you. It's, it's helping shoreline habitat projects in general. It also can help public access design projects. Um, so bringing your concerns and advocating for your communities on these projects will provide the experience and skills that will um, one day, you know, maybe lead you to uh, submit your own permit application to be CDC for a, a, a shoreline project design. Um, and so I just wanted to, yeah, share the, these are some of the, some of the possibilities of the types of projects that you might want to bring one day to be CDC. Um, and let's see here. So, um, and I'm sure that you're already very, you know, well aware and savvy on what it takes to advocate for environmental justice. Um, but I wanted to just kind of reemphasize the point that along with all of this education and awareness that you're already engaging in, um, the advocacy piece is really needed to ensure that your voices are not just there contributing to projects, but that your voice is growing in these planning conversations that are already taking place about um, how, how your shoreline and how your community will be um, altered and uh, developed in the years to come. So, um, so this Shoreline Leadership Academy is the result of um, many years of advocacy um, from many community leaders. And, um, and it's really cool that it's, uh, it's gotten to this point and we just want to make sure we're doing everything in our power to elevating your voice even more so. Um, so because we would like, we would love our goal through our policies is for a more equitable shoreline uh, for all. So I just want, I also wanted to share that on that note, um, the CDC has uh, taken our a commitment to environmental justice and social equity to a new level recently. Um, we, I'm excited to share that we recently recruited a group of environmental justice experts to support my work as the EJ manager on developing a strategy for how the agency can best implement our new policies. So um, we're, they're called the EJ advisors and they bring extensive expertise and experience and uh, perspectives from CBOs serving socially vulnerable, underrepresented indigenous and environmental justice um, populations. And um, the group strives to develop, um, well, BCDC, we strive to develop long-term relationships with leaders in these communities in the nine county Bay area. And so the EJ advisors are helping BCDC advance our goals by providing independent analysis, recommendations, and other input on how we should 
uh, be working as an agency and implementing our new policies. So these advisors um, have been working together with me uh, for about, it's been about, I think, three months so far. We're still refining our work plan. We're more so focused on getting to know one another. Um, it's We're building relationships between uh, these individuals and their communities and all of BCDC. So as you can imagine, the relationship building and capacity building piece of this work is going to take quite a while is what I'm learning now. Actually, it's, it's something that I'm being reminded of is that relationship building, you can't just have a meeting and say, okay, let's get started on working together. Um, it's really something that needs to be uh, genuine and it, need, and it will take time. So um, thankfully we do have six uh, community members that are being, or community experts that are uh, receiving funding to um, help us understand what it takes to really do this right. And so we have Selena um, Feliciano from, she's a West Oakland resident. Um, and then we have Julio Garcia, who was uh, already a um, EJ review team member helping the CDC with our policies. Um, you might recognize um, Maribel Tobias, who's an environmental justice lawyer that advocates on marginalized and overburdened communities. She co-facilitated the West Oakland Community Plan um, to improve air quality. And she also uh, co-facilitated and co-authored the Equitable Climate Adaptation Plan for Oakland. So she's definitely a powerhouse. Um, LaDonna Williams here uh, represents, she's a highly experienced community leader from South Vallejo, and uh, she advocates for environmental justice in African-American disadvantaged communities throughout the Bay Area. Anthony Khalil represents Bayview Hunters Point, and he works on ecological restoration and community engagement. And then we have Violet Sayena, who's a community advocate in San Mateo County um, and works on climate change. And I would love for at least one of you, like in our future um, cohort, in our future advisory group, because I'm hoping to expand this group and I want the group to be this uh, sustainable ongoing um, board that informs VCDC's project. So um, I could really see this being an awesome opportunity for you all um, as a cohort alumni. Um, so finally, I wanted to share a bit about a effort that BCDC has been convening for the past eight, 18 months. Um, it's called Bay Adapt. It's the, it's the regional strategy for a rising bay. And your own Phoenix Armenta, as well as Ms. Margaret Gordon, are members of the leadership advisory group um, that have been uh, leading these conversations about Bay Adapt. Um, Phoenix and Ms. Margaret are joined by three other EJ experts that form the EJ caucus for Bay Adopt. And um, they've all been bringing the critical equity and EJ lens to hundreds of hours of conversations that we've been having about this regional strategy for a rising bay. Um, and Phoenix has directly um, not only been a part of the conversation, but has actually, um, we've sat down together and we've actually uh, worked on developing the content for the final report for uh, this effort. So um, it's a consensus driven strategy that is uh, addressing sea level rise as a region. And it's trying to be as collaborative as, as possible. Um, it hones in on the need to adapt equitably um, and it balances the need to protect the ecological heart of the region, which is the Bay, with other critical needs such as our economy, housing and robust transportation. So um, as we all recognize the time to come together as a region to, to prepare for sea level rise is now. Um, and so we need to really have a shared strategy as a region because the Bay does not see our borders between our counties and cities. And so um, we need to come together and share our strategies, our solutions, and also ensure that the, the solutions that some areas um, decide to uh, create for sea level rise don't negatively impact adjacent areas. So there's a lot of reasons why we need to design this as a region. And um, this is just, I just uh, am sharing the two pager that we recently developed 
to share more about the program, which I can share with Phoenix to send to you all um, as a follow-up if you're more if you're interested in learning more about this. Um, but it's been a very uh, it's been a process that we said would be a year, and it's already been 18 months. Um, but we feel pretty good about the final joint platforms. Not final. It's a draft because we still have a public comment period. But um, it's the the uh, current draft of the joint platform, and it includes nine actions and 20 tasks that we as a region can um, agree to so that we're moving forward together on addressing this issue. Um, I'm not gonna read all of these actions out, but I did want to point out uh, action one has, um, is very, action one and task 1.1 is focused on um, ensuring that the vision is rooted in community. So as we create a long-term regional vision for sea level rise, um, the first task, the first action is to ensure that it's rooted in communities, which means we need people like you, we need your voices to be leading these conversations um, of what, you, what your concerns are and what you would like to see. Action two is really the, what we consider, what people have been considering like the environmental justice action which is elevate communities to lead. Um, this includes improving how communities and public agencies learn from one another. So we're imagining some uh, trainings to take place in the near future that um, would, would have like these cross pollination where communities educate government and educate other stakeholders while those stakeholders can come in. And it's basically what you're already doing with the Shoreline Leadership Academy. Um, and then 2.2 uh, is really critical, which is funding the participation and leadership of CBOs and frontline communities in adaptation planning. So this is, again, a very critical component that still has not been totally figured out um, yet. But as, as you might have heard, there is a multi-billion dollar um, budget for uh, climate adaptation and resilience. and um, we're hoping that a large percentage of that will go to the ensuring that um, frontline community members are involved in the um, adaptation process. Um, so beyond that, we have these other actions. Um, level uh, Action number three also is pretty important for, it, it's critical for your uh, communities to be involved in, which is telling those regional stories about um, local regional story, local and regional stories um, to understand, to have a better understanding of what's really happening on the ground. Um, because we have our scientific models, but the stories of what's already happening and on the front lines are going to be more um, robust and powerful for us to be aware of as we start developing our various projects. So, Again, so as I mentioned, um, we do have a public uh, comment period that's going to be initiated starting after this event. And I wanna invite you all, if you haven't seen already, um, Phoenix is one of the panelists that will be sharing their perspective on, um, on what they experienced and what they uh, are taking away and what they're excited about um, on the Bay Adapt uh, convening and the strategy. And so on Wednesday at five o'clock, please join for this free event on deepening local and regional connections to adapt to sea level rise. Um, it's an it's, uh, event that um, is being hosted by SPUR, which is a local um, urban and regional planning agency, or not agency, organization. Um, so we're going to talk about how the region will equitably and collectively adapt to um, the rising shoreline. And one other idea that Phoenix mentioned is a possibility is I think that you have some, uh, you have an opportunity to develop a social media or communications project. So I wanted to um, throw an idea out there for a project, which is if you want, would like to attend the event and um, maybe develop a post um, that uh, you could post on your social media that we could collaborate. BCDC would love, our social media team would love to collaborate with you and um, 
and we could do like a joint posting or you could post and then we could repost. So that's just an idea that Phoenix mentioned that I thought would be really cool. So that's all I have for my presentation today. So I'm gonna stop sharing and open it to questions. And um, from there, I do want to offer the opportunity to play around with the various uh, maps that I mentioned today. Thank you so much. Let's see here. Are there any questions? Hi, Nahal. This is Hannah Mendoza. Hi, um, Hannah. You are a breath of fresh air. Um, hey. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you made everything so understandable, um, easy to understand. Um, get, I got a better picture about the work um, and everything okay. else that you talked about. So um, thank you so much for that. Um, I appreciate what uh, the work that BCDC is doing as well. Thank you. It makes it more sort of commuter. It makes it a lot more community community friendly and um, community, um, you know, uh, what do you call that? What's the English word for just be being able to better understand the work. And it is empowering because, um, you know, when we can actually understand, um, you know, uh, the information that's being uh, presented to us, and especially for people who don't have a lot of, um, uh, uh, oh, here I am, a lot of uh, experience in this, but want to do the work. Um, so thank you so much. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I really appreciate your feedback and I'm happy to hear that. <laughs> keep doing what you're doing. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, I'll jump in. No, no, Hall, you mentioned um, that there would be an opportunity for folks to maybe join the equity advisor team. Can you talk a little bit more about what it would, what's the process for doing that and what you think the timeline might be? Yeah, definitely. Um, so right now the, we have the six advisors that I mentioned, um, they are being funded by Resources Legacy Fund to do, to participate um, in the strategy development process at BCDC um, just for, it's a one year um, kind of like it's not a trial, but it's like a, a on paper, it's a one year commitment. Um, in conversation, it's at least three years. Um, so we're still developing um, the terms and the actual design of the program itself. I wanted everything about the program to be community led. So I waited until we had the advisors on board before I even started coming up with a plan for them. Um, I wanted them to create their own plan. So this whole time we've been um, building relationships with each other as an advisory group, building relationships between them and staff and them and the commissioners. And then after getting um, about four different meetings where it was mainly just presentations from staff about what BCDC does and how BCDC staff can see their input supporting their work. Um, now that they have like a more comprehensive idea of how they can um, guide us. Uh, now they're finally like at the point where they're like, okay, I'm ready to come up with our work plan, the principles and the overall design of how to make sure that this advisory group is sustainable for the years to come. So they're developing their own strategy. And so um, from what we've talked about so far, they do see, um, that you know, six people is not enough to represent the entire nine county Bay shoreline. So ideally we will be expanding the group. Um, and uh, so my personal goal is to at least have one more seat before the end of their term added. So we'll have seven members. My personal goal is for that seventh member to be a tribal representative. Um, so if anyone hears of tribal ancestry or indigenous ancestry, I welcome you to really keep an eye out, but um, I'm not gonna limit it to that. But I just, that's my personal goal is like one more seat, one more person, one more representative um, before the end of the year. And um, once we can prove, we have to kind of prove our success to resources legacy funds. Um, to be able to receive years two and three of funding. So 
with when I have a better idea of that funding commitment, then I'll be able to expand the group further and um, recruit another group of advisors. To actually, my my goal would be to recruit new individuals to join the current group for now, just so there's continuity. And then after that, we would probably have some new members kind of replace old members. So we're still, long story short, still in the development process, but the process has was very straightforward for them to apply. It was like a two page application that was like mostly narrative format, like talk about what you care about, you know, like what's your background in environmental justice? Where, you know, what community do you live in? And, you know, it was kind of um, as as um, low burden, you know, like as possible, because I know that a lot of these funding applications and government applications are just a pain. Um, so I tried to make it as as easy as possible. So I will happily um, share that with you when we're ready to recruit the next group. So again, the last group was um, started their contract with the funder in April of this, like last April. Um, and then they started working with me in early, in late May. So I would say that we could, we could expect another round of applications, fingers crossed that we get the funding um, around February, maybe. So like, yeah, February or March, maybe soon, right after you all graduate from this program or whatever you're calling it. Are you calling it graduate? <laughs> uh, I guess we hadn't really been on graduate. <laughs> was that helpful, Phoenix? It's kind of like we're to, I don't know yet. Because yeah, kind of like. <laughs> Thank you for that. Okay, good. No problem. Uh, do we have any other questions? Veronica. Oh, oh. yeah. I was just, um, you know. It sounds like you have been understanding the community process of relationship building is, is by far the very first thing you wanna do and build trust. That could take you know months, if not years um, in my experience. So how, it is, how do you navigate the funding to match that? Cause that's a curious thing. Three months is like not enough time to, you know, get to know a new group, you might have Thanks. to go through. Yeah, I'm curious around that. That's a really good point. Um, and it's basically something that I've talked to Phoenix about for a very long time uh, because the, the relationship development, like the fostering those relationships, especially when they're between parties or they're between groups that do not have trust at all, like they have actual distrust between one another. Um, it is multiple years. And that that's so real that it's, it's kind of shocking that funding doesn't already take that into account. They just want to, a lot of funding is for projects, you know, capital P, like uh, shovel ready, like you should just magically already know all the people that you want to work with. And, you know, like none of the funding, um, not none of it, but it's rare to see funding opportunities that uh, pay people for the time required to build those relationships. Um, and so through Bay Adapt, um, one of the kind of advocacy efforts and law, I guess lobbying efforts that is coming out of that is for not only for, um, for the group from the Bay Adapt effort and all of our communities that we represent, to be, have, to be um, considered by the state when the state's developing the budget for, this is just an example, like when the state's developing the budget for climate um, adaptation, um, there's a lot of advocates from the Bay that are going saying, you know, we need to make sure that communities are compensated. So don't just like make the, these funding opportunities be about projects for adaptation. The funding opportunities should be, you know, a whole new uh, version of funding, which is the planning. It's kind of like, they call it planning. It's relationship building, but they would call it a planning proposal. So it's like, 
it's not shovel ready. It's a, all the things that go into be, to being able to create the project that is ready, like the design of the project, which is capacity building, education, awareness, outreach, relationships. And that's a planning proposal. Um, so that's one example, but I also, in my minimal interactions that I hope to become more um, robust with private foundations, Phoenix has been leading the way on this as well with the work that they did with the Resilient Communities Initiative, but just working with funders, private funders on understanding this very point as well and helping them come up with a new structure to their funding opportunities that recognize and um, respect the fact that relationships are, are key for any of this to really work. Thank you. Is that, yeah. And we, I mean, your voice should be involved in those conversations for sure. There's, it's shocking that they're still just in, con it seems like it's mainly just in conversation mode still. So it's kind of like, we need to make this happen like years ago. But. But it is cool that a group like Resources Legacy Fund has been covering the relationships between like the EJ advisors and BCDC and like, you know, just making sure that BCDC has time to work directly with community leaders and paying the community leaders um, through like our EJ advisors program. And for, prior to that was the EJ review team. And that was all funding from Resources Legacy Fund. Awesome. Any more questions? Do you think it would be um, interesting to folks to, to play with the various mapping tools? Or, I mean, you have the link, so you could do that now if you want and then come back together. I was thinking like we could, we could go off and do it on our own and then come back together and chat about our experience working with the tool, but I don't want to, um, if you're kind of good for now, that's cool too. <laughs> what do you think, Phoenix? Um, I think we could, yeah, we could take some time for folks to kind of check out the mapping tools. Um, okay. Do it. Let me, let me put the links in the chat again. Are there specific things you want them to check out with the mapping tools? Um, I think just messing, I mean, I learned to use them just by kind of playing around with like clicking all the different um, scenarios and then running the tool. Cause if you click the scenarios and run the tool, it just really shows you like, um, I think that one is maybe the community vulnerability. The one, wait, let me double check. Yeah, so those are the two tools. So the first link is the, um, the flood explorer. So if you click on that and, um, and go into the explore function, it'll let you just, you can kind of type in a city or a address even, and then you can zoom in on that and uh, run the various scenarios that are on the right side of the screen and just see how the flooding might impact your community um, or, or the area that you're looking at if it's not within your specific community. So, um, Sometimes it's just interesting to see like major uh, transportation routes that you take or something, even if it's not where you live. It's like, oh, when we're not virtual anymore, I might not be able to go to work anymore, like to the office. Or... So there's just interesting things there. There's nothing else really specific on that one. Um, and, then I, and then the community vulnerability mapping tool, if you're interested in um, seeing how we indicated the different levels of vulnerability of like of you know the different indicators of social vulnerability and which communities actually um actually are considered highly or you know those levels um i i have done that in my own community and sometimes i when you mess around with the tool you might notice that there's an area that you're like there's no way, like, for example, the whole campus of Stanford is considered highly socially vulnerable. Not that we have jurisdiction there because it's away from the shoreline, but it's because a lot of the data that goes into it is census block group data. 
and some and so the student you know like the census will show that like um the campus doesn't have uh people that have jobs or something you know because they're students so there's like if they're unemployed students that doesn't automatically mean that they are um low income they're just unemployed so it's like there's things that get triggered that are um, not 100% accurate, but um, but again, the data that we're using is data from census, and it's not. It's kind of like if you notice an area that you're like, no, this area definitely is highly socially vulnerable. Why isn't it showing here? Then you can actually reach out to BCDC and let us know, and um, we can we can reflect your information. Um, through like another layer that would show that the community um, vetted or like the, the uh, what is it, the anecdotal data that's coming directly from communities mouths and like from your voices, that anecdotal data could be a new layer that's showing while the census information and the income data and the housing data don't show that my community is low, is highly vulnerable, I can tell you from my lived experience, you know, that yes, we need to be considered as a highly vulnerable population as well. So um, that's something that you can do, you can start working on if you're interested through the tool um, or vice versa. You could say that area is definitely not and then just let us know and we could go in and kind of put a um, disclaimer potentially on the map that's like the information here is, you know, needs to be refined because we're always updating our um, maps if that makes sense <laughs> um hana it looks like your hand is raised again hi yes um just wanted to um just sort of put this in people's you know minds and 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 possibly for future um or even you know something that we could implement um, during the academy, um, or not, I'm just putting it out there. Um, uh, some of us, specific, you know, me, I'm talking about myself, have, we don't have the experience in using these tools. Um, so we may not, you know, readily go to them and use them. So I'm, I, I don't know if, you know, part of what we should be learning in this um, experience is how to nav navigate and use those things. Uh, some people get curious, they get on there, they can figure it out. Some people don't. And so I feel like that's a part that might be missing for some of us. And like I, I said, I'm speaking for myself. Um, so, you know, and I'm not saying that, you know, I, this is what I want something BCDC to do or anything like that, but just to consider that in, 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 in your inclusive process, um, I mean, I've never really looked at these tools. The, 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 the maps and things you showed me today have been some of the ones that I've been able to understand the most uh, compared to other maps I've been exposed to um, in this process. So I, I just kind of want to put that out there. Again, I really appreciate your um, feedback and your um, recommendation. And um, I mean, we do have time if you are, if you would like me to just start us out. Um, I can, I'm happy to share my screen and just start us out with some of these tools. Okay, I'll do that. Um, no problem. Let me just, let me get that page loaded really quick and I'll just go straight in and um, show you what it looks like. I really appreciate the feedback. This is, I'm all about this kind of uh, interactive type of conversation so thanks <laughs> okay so i'm going to share my screen and go straight into the flood explorer do you see it okay mm -hmm. okay cool and this is something that phoenix did request but i was like i have so much to cover in my presentation i don't know if i'm gonna have time to go into this so just fyi phoenix was hoping that this would happen and um i did ask the person that built the tool to come do the actual like full technical demo and uh, he was not available. So bear with me. Um, so, <laughs> so here it is. Um, you can either go to the tutorial or just go straight into the Explorer. 
um, which I do encourage you to go to the tutorial uh, because it's actually, it's kind of fun actually, the way it's laid out. Um, it shares like a history of all the data and where we got it from and kind of answers that original question um, that we had about where's the backend data coming from. So the tutorial explains all of that. Um, but for now, I'm going to just um, click on, so let me see. So you up here in the top right, it says enter address or location. Um, so I did, as you can see, when I when I played with it, I went into, I, I typed in West Oakland BART. Um, and so here we are. And then I'm gonna zoom out just to show like the um, proximity to the shoreline. So here we go. And um, from there, you go to here, it says total water level up on the right, it says one map, many futures, and then choose a scenario. So I click there and then you can click any of these scenarios and you can do them all together. So let's start with 12, just to, out of interest. So as you can see, or hopefully you can see that the line here, um, there's a line right on the shoreline that's blue. It's like really dark blue, so it's hard to even see it. Um, so this is showing that, I mean, it's not a ton of impact on the community at 12, um, 12 inches. But then if you click on, like if I click on King Tide, um, it, it, you see down here, like in the Alameda area, it gets a little more impacted. And then on top of that, I can add the 50 year flood, 50 year um, tide storm surge. And let me see if it lets me drag. Yeah, it's letting me drag the map. So that is impacting, as you can see, it's more impacting Alameda, but there are some areas here in your community that are getting some, um, some flooding impacts. So again, that was just with um, 12 inches and then the 50 year. But if you go into 24 inches and King Tide, um, actually that looks like it's the same. But when I did the, my, when I showed you the screenshots of those maps, that was showing 36 inches. So I'm gonna show you again, the 36 inches and the King Tide. And actually it's not showing, it's not showing too much, but here it is. This is where it's showing the impacts in, in the Oakland shoreline. Um, and so that's where you'll see that there is uh, actual flooding taking place. And that's with the king tide. Um, I'll do it with a 25 year king tide. And then you're seeing that it gets in, it kind of blocks off some of the major um, transportation infrastructure. Um, and so this is, the color is indicating that it's mostly zero to two feet of flooding, but some of the areas will get as bad as four to six feet. Um, it also shows some impacts up here from the, from the I-80 flooding. So I'm gonna remove the 25 year surge, let's see, the no storm surge. So this is 36 inches with no storm surge. And it's mostly north of I-80, but, um, but then when you add a storm surge, it's obviously a much higher impact. Um, so yeah, this tool also has the opportunity, it shows you that you can, um, you can outline counties if you would like. Um, so this, if I zoomed out, you would see that it's just Alameda County. So it's showing your county boundaries. Um, I don't think we have the city boundaries, unfortunately, but I think that's because we're, we were doing our assessment as far as the operational landscape units. So I, yeah, when you zoom out, you see that like your that Alameda County will be heavily impacted as a county. 
the shoreline, especially down here, but this is mostly our the salt ponds and um, the funding that went into actually uh, the supporting the Shoreline Leadership Academy is the same as like a, a major pot of funding that's um, that is paying for the restoration of the salt ponds too. And that's protecting the folks that live in Union City, Hayward. Um, and actually it's a, this restoration project down here, while it's adjacent to Palo Alto and Union City and, and San Jose and Mountain View, um, it's, it's, an, it's a critical uh, mitigation project for the entire Bay to be protected from sea level rise as a whole. So hopefully that's helpful. Any questions now that we did this little, little model or little uh, exercise? Okay, and then, so I'm gonna type in, let me just go straight into the other one. Um, let's see if it lets me, there we go. I'm gonna get the community vulnerability mapping tool loaded. So this has a um, agreement. It tells you where the data comes from. Again, it's our, ten, our census data. Um, the data is intended for sea level rise adaptation. So it's basically just saying you're agreeing to the conditions, which is how we're presenting our data, agreeing that you understand that. So this tool, again, is showing the um, levels of uh, social vulnerability that um, we are, have indicated through the um, indicators that I explained earlier, but as I type in, I'll go ahead and say the same thing. So West Oakland, oops, what happened? Uh-oh, it's forcing me to sign in. You're not supposed, you don't have to sign in. I don't know why I did that. Glitch. That's what I got too when I, when I was playing with it. Oh, really? Yeah. Maybe the, you know what, the link that I sent might have been from when I was signed in. Oh, yeah. Okay. That's probably what happened. Sorry about that. So I think that if we went into maybe just end at apps, let's see what happens there. Like if you delete the rest of the link and after apps, okay, yeah. that's not working either. Okay. Well, for, let me just show you how to get there from our website then. <laughs> Um, this is good because it's getting recorded and going on Facebook Live. So. Oh, perfect. <laughs> that makes me happy. Um, so if you go actually to our website, um, it's pretty easy to find the tool. So it's under information and resources and then maps and data. And these are all of our different types of tools and maps. So here's the community vulnerability mapping tool. This also has the options to learn. So there's a tutorial uh, and then you can actually download apps too. But I'm just gonna go into the explore link and our, our I'll type in um, our website. It's bcdc.ca.gov that I can type it in too. Or maybe, Phoenix, would you be able to type it in please? Just bcdc.ca.gov. Thank you. Okay, so let's try this again. It's doing it again. Oh my gosh. Well, you know what? Yeah, I'm not gonna get too embarrassed. We'll, we'll just fix that. <laughs> um, I'll let the GIS manager know that that's, we're having a glitch on that. Um, and sorry that that happened. Not ideal, of course. So, um, yeah, that needs to be working. So, okay, well, I guess that we can't do that, that demo quite at this moment, um, but I'm glad that we figured that out. So that's important information for me to relay to our GIS manager. Um, but if you do go in and notice 
if there's any questions, I really, I welcome you to please reach out anytime um, with that, with questions on that or anything else, really. Um, I would love to continue collaborating with you all um, in the future. And again, I wanted to mention the opportunity on Wednesday where Phoenix will be speaking on the panel for the Bay Adapt Public Forum. Um, and if anyone's, again, I'm gonna just offer the, if anyone's interested in doing a communications project on that um, event, just let, let me know. I just put my email address in the chat. And so I guess, is there, yeah. Did you awesome. have it? No, thank you. This is, this is great. Yeah, thank you. I love your picture. <laughs> uh -huh. If we, if there was one more question, we have a few more minutes, but anyone else? Well, if there's no more questions, I just want to say thank you, Nahal, for that presentation. It was really amazing. I really appreciate you joining us today. Thank you so much for inviting me. And it was great to be here and meet everyone. Hope you have a great rest of your day and weekend. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Talk so to you much. later. Or, yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. And for, for everyone else, we're gonna pause for lunch. Uh, so, you know, you can turn off your screens, uh, if, stay logged in, or if you wanna just come back at one o'clock, we're gonna be starting our next presentation at one o'clock. Take care, everyone. All right, Bye. thank you, thank you.